This video is brought to you by PCBWay, who supplied the circuit boards for this project. More about them later. Hi. Today we're going to be taking another look at the mini MS-DOS gaming PC that I built a few months ago. If you haven't seen that video then here's a link to it, but the gist of it is that I built a 486 PC using a tiny industrial motherboard form factor called PC104. I'm very pleased with the end result, but there's a few tweaks and upgrades I want to make. The first thing I want to do is get better performance. Although it runs most DOS games just fine, because it doesn't have a floating point unit, there are issues on later games that use one, like Duke Nukem 3D and Quake. In the former case, the frame rate is very poor on levels that use sloped surfaces, and in the latter case, the game doesn't start at all. The motherboard I used originally had a Vortex 86 SX processor, which is a 486 class chip which runs at 300 MHz. Considering most other 486 processors top out at 100 MHz, this seems like it will be very fast, but it doesn't seem to work like that. You see, the Vortex 86 range, which is manufactured by a Taiwanese company called DM&P, has quite a long history. It has its roots in the MP6 processor designed by Rise Technologies in the late 90s to be a competitor to the Pentium MMX range. The MP6 was then incorporated into a series of system-on-chips by Silicon Integrated Systems. DM&P in turn bought the design and turned it into the original Vortex 86 chip, which I'll refer to here as the OG Vortex 86. DM&P, under their iCOP brand, then used the OG Vortex 86 in a range of PC-104 motherboards such as this iCOP 6070. Fuck. They subsequently discontinued the OG Vortex 86, but went on to release a lot of other processors under the Vortex 86 brand, starting with the SX variant I currently have in my mini PC, and continuing up to the present day with the DX, EX and MX ranges. I'm not sure if any of these processors are directly based on the OG Vortex 86, as they seem to be very different in terms of peripherals and architecture. I wouldn't be surprised if the SX and later variants were a complete re-implementation, but we'll get to that later. Now, I managed to get hold of a fair few different motherboards in the Vortex 86 range. As well as the OG and SX PC-104 boards, I discovered a range of thin clients made by Ebox that use a few different models of the Vortex 86, specifically the DX, DX2 and MX. I thought it would be interesting to benchmark them all using the DOS Benchmark Pack by Phil's Computer Lab, I'll give you a link to his YouTube channel below. Now a lot of the benchmarks don't really make sense on newer processors, so I've tried to only include ones that actually attempt to measure game performance, but I'll give you a link to the full results in the video description. As you can see, the results show that, counterintuitively, the OG Vortex 86, despite running at 166MHz, actually outperforms the 300MHz SX in every benchmark. Even more importantly, it is able to run the tests that require a floating point unit like Chris 3D and Quake. Although it has a much higher power consumption than any other Vortex CPU, it's a much better fit for an MS-DOS gaming PC than the SX. There are some other takeaways from these benchmarks too. The 166MHz OG performs about the same as a 166MHz Pentium, but the SX at 300MHz performs more like a 100MHz Pentium. Similarly, the 800MHz and 933MHz MX and DX ranges perform like an Intel processor with about half the clock speed. I imagine the reason for this is power consumption. Anyway, I replaced the SX motherboard with the OG one, and everything runs much better now. Duke Nukem 3D runs at a fantastic frame rate, even in the higher resolution modes. Quake and Tomb Raider run pretty well too, and it also fixed some other issues like random popping noises on the sound output with certain games. So I think I'll leave the OG motherboard in and find something else to do with the SX. Now the next thing to do is replace the sound card. The original was designed in just a few hours and had a number of problems with it. So just briefly, sound support in MS-DOS, like most things back then, evolved over a number of years and got more and more complicated with time. If you want to build a PC that supports most games, you need an ad-lib for 80s games, a sound blaster for early 90s games, and an MPU-401 for mid-90s games. So it's no surprise that Crystal Semiconductor decided enough was enough and designed a single chip that could emulate all of these sound cards. The chip in question is the CS4237, which is actually one of the later iterations of the Crystal chips, and I believe has better ad-lib emulation than the earlier ones. It also emulates the Sound Blaster Pro and has an MPU-401 compatible MIDI output as well. This is enough to support the vast majority of MS-DOS games, and the chip was used in a lot of low-cost generic sound cards in the mid-90s. I actually bought one of these cards for a fiver on eBay just to use as a reference. Obviously, the CS4237 is long discontinued, but they are still available new old stock from, for example, UT Source very cheaply. 
Even better, documentation on the part is extremely widely available, and there is even a reference design document with a complete schematic, so the chip is an ideal candidate for our open source PC-104 sound card. Now let's get down to designing. I normally use Altium Circuit Maker for my open source projects, as I'm pretty used to Altium Designer, and Circuit Maker has most of the useful features for free. There is a user-created part library, but unsurprisingly nobody had created a 25-year-old obsolete sound chip in Circuit Maker yet, so I had to do that manually. Then it's basically just a matter of cloning the reference document as best we can, making changes where needed. For example, I omitted most of the inputs and outputs because the card only needs a single stereo line out, but I added a wave blaster port to let me use MIDI music without an external synthesizer. Next we have to lay out the board. Starting with the PC-104 specifications, we create a board with the correct dimensions and with the connectors in the right place. Then components have to be arranged on the board, and finally we simply join all the dots. Now obviously it's a lot more complicated than that, but there are already a million videos on YouTube about circuit board design, so I won't go into any real detail about it, especially as I'm not in any way an expert in analog design and I've probably made a fair few poor design choices. However, the design works well enough for my purposes and I'm perfectly happy with it. Now let's get the board made. The fabrication company PCB Wave very kindly offered to manufacture these for me, so let's go through the process. Firstly, we need to export Gerber files. On PCBWay's website, they have tutorials for all the most popular software, so we just need to follow the instructions for Circuit Maker, which I'll give you a link to below. Now that's done, we put all the Gerbers and drill into a zip file and go to the PCBWay website. Personally, I prefer to use the Quick Order option, as it fills in a lot of the options in for us if we give it the Gerbers as a reference. As you can see, the cost of the PCBs is only $5, but the best part of it is, if you're a first-time customer, you get $5 off your first order, which basically means you just pay shipping. Isn't that great? Anyway, the boards arrived less than a week later, and they look really good, so let's get to assembly. It should be noted that although this doesn't have any super small parts, it probably isn't a good project for anyone learning to solder, so if you can't handle surface mount components, then hit up PCBWay. They offer assembly services for as little as $30. But if you fancy taking a shot at it, you'll need a temperature controlled soldering iron with a couple of different tips. Start by adding a lot of flux to the circuit board, then we can put the chip in place, making sure pin 1 is near the white dot on the PCB. I generally put a tiny blob of solder on the iron, then tack down one of the corner pins, then the pin on the opposite corner. Then go back and make sure all the pins line up, before putting more solder on your iron and dragging it across each side of the IC to get all the pins soldered. Usually there will be some pins that have been accidentally soldered together, in which case just add more flux and poke it with the iron. It should sort itself out. If you just can't get the bridge to clear, you can use solder braid to suck the solder up. The only other hard to assemble part is the PC-104 connector, because the inner two rows of pins are kind of hard to get at. I suggest soldering the long connector first, then do the outer row of the shorter connector, then come back with a fine tip and get the inner row. There's also an EEPROM chip that needs to be programmed. I believe the official Crystal drivers support programming the EEPROM directly on the board, but I couldn't get that to work, so I programmed it directly using my cheapo TL-866 ROM programmer that has to rank as one of the most useful pieces of equipment I own. Now it's time to boot it up on our PC-104 motherboard and run the driver. I usually first test with Doom, as it supports Adlib, Sound Blaster, and MPU-401. On Adlib mode, the music has a synthy sort of sound. And on MPU-401 mode, the Dream Blaster's sampled instruments sound a bit more natural. Then we can test the Sound Blaster compatibility by simply triggering a few sound effects. Right, let's play some more games. Since I made the last video, I found this great PC game compilation by a person called Jojo, which I'll give you a link to below. It's called PC DOS Mini, and it's basically a customized version of FreeDOS that includes over 100 game demos on a super neat little menu system. This is a great way of getting a DOS game collection started, as it lets you figure out what games you're likely to enjoy, and then you can upgrade them to the full versions by downloading them from GOG or Steam or wherever. I haven't tried all the games yet, but I'll report back at some point with some statistics on how many work and how many don't, as well as some of my favourites. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I have some even more awesome retro PC builds coming up soon, so get subscribed and hit the notification button if you don't want to miss those. Thanks very much for watching. Bye!